morning. Good morning. Okay, so um, I think that, the, again, my name is Dorival Ruiz Diaz, so fertility specialist, uh, uh, Department of Agronomy. Uh, and the plan this morning is really, uh, I will start uh, with uh, talking to about a few topics, uh, focus a little bit more on phosphorus, touch on nitrogen, uh, and maybe a few things that we need to think about uh, when it comes to trying to get the most out of the fertilizer that we obviously uh, put a high price. Um, then uh, Lucas Heck will be here uh, also uh, talking more on the economics of fertility, soil sampling, all of that, put in perspective. And then Ian Presley uh, is going to talk about cover crops and especially thinking about cover crops in the context of nutrients, right? And so, um, so that's kind of the plan for this morning. Um, and so, uh, for uh, now, I think for my uh, one thing I want to emphasize if you have questions, comments, please don't hesitate to stop me. Um, anything that you have in mind about things that we are showing here or anything else, please don't hesitate to stop me. We'll keep it informal. I think that's really the, the best the best part of these meetings, uh, the discussion. Um, okay, let's see if this works. <laughs> okay, so again, uh, a few of the things I'd like to, to discuss in, 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 in the time that I have today, I, I'd like to focus a little bit more on phosphorus, but really putting a little bit in context, uh, the economic return to phosphorus fertilizer and thinking about soil tests as well. Um, and then, of course, spend some time on nitrogen, but also uh, other things that are becoming maybe limiting factor uh, for uh, uh, yields and, and yield potential. We see more issues with sulfur. Um, pH, um, I think, is, is something that we need to think about for sure. Uh, and, and especially, again, uh, given the potential for, um, you know, low availability of things like phosphorus. You know, we know that. And so I'll, we'll talk a little bit on that and also just touch a, a few things on manure as well. Um, and so one of the things this, you've seen this before, um, the, um, essentially the options we have for managing uh, phosphorus uh, in, in the soil, we have, this is a graph that basically shows relative yield here, uh, and soil test uh, phosphorus in melic 3 uh, parts per million. And one thing I want to emphasize here, melic 3 and I'll talk a little bit more about this later, but you know, we do have uh, different soil test methods and that can make a difference depending on the situation. So I think that's something we need to, we need, we always need to keep in mind. Um, and so we basically have a couple options. And again, I want to start with this, but you know, we have the, if we are below that 20 part per million soil test uh, phosphorus, we really are thinking about a sufficiency approach where uh, we need to apply phosphorus and typically we'll expect to see a yield response that year, right? And then the other option, uh, the other uh, situation essentially is where we have higher soil test speed, where we will not necessarily expect a yield response, but we basically have essentially uh, sufficient phosphorus in the soil to supply the needs, okay? So basically money in the bank in a way uh, when you have that higher test speed. And, and we'll talk more about that, but I think that's a situation where, you know, many of you maybe are this year, that, that could be one situation where you can take advantage of that and maybe just use some of that extra phosphorus that we have. Um, again, those are some opportunities we need to think about. Um, okay, uh, so again, we kind of talked about this already, the, the sufficiency, there are uh, a few key things that we need to keep in mind. If we are low in salt test phosphorus, um, you know, obviously it's going to be economic return to application that particular year. Uh, typically, of course, we manage salt tests on the low side when we are doing that. Um, and one of the key things I want to emphasize here is that, you know, nutrient applications pretty much require when you have low test EP. And, and I'll show you a little bit on the economics on that as well. So that's, that's the key things we need to think about here. We have less flexibility. And then on the flip side, the build and maintain uh, scenario where we have higher soil test phosphorus. Um, again, obviously we are uh, focusing on maintaining soil tests in that non-responsive range, basically trying to take care of phosphorus a little bit on the high side and make sure we don't have any limitation there. Um, but a couple of things that are really, uh, you know, attractive this year is that, uh, you know, give us basically more flexibility. We may not necessarily need to apply any phosphorus, okay, in a year like this. And again, some of you that may be being building up salt SP, year like this is a year when you can kind of take advantage of what you've been putting extra in the past, okay? So that's really the whole purpose. And I think that's, that's something we need to, to keep in mind. Um, Again, a lot of that has to do with cash flow, you know, the, the, uh, the economics, of course, and so that gives us a lot of that flexibility. 
Okay, so um, I, I got a question uh, like before uh, Christmas. Uh, you know, what, what kind of uh, economic return we can expect uh, on phosphorus depending on soil test B? So I put this graph. This is uh, data from uh, 12 locations uh, last year, um, uh, from uh, 2021, uh, multiple locations across the state uh, on corn. And so what we have here is soil test phosphorus uh, in Melik 3, again, uh, six inches. Um, and then here is economic return to uh, phosphorus fertilizer. The numbers I use here is uh, this here. Again, this is I did it uh, early December, uh, maybe different now for sure. Um, but what do we have? Essentially, what you see here is that, you know, somewhere around that, slightly below 20 part per million, we start to see a positive uh, return to that fertilizer investment in that particular year. Okay. So the question again, if we're sitting somewhere in that, let's say 25 or 30 parts per million so of TSP, is it gonna pay this year to apply phosphorus? Not necessarily, right? Gonna be, we're not seeing a, a return to that. Why? Because we're not seeing a yield response, okay? However, anything below that range, yes, you are making money by putting phosphorus. And so how I did this, this is 60 pounds of P205. So you took 60, 60 pounds of P205 as a reference. Why I did that? That's roughly what 200 bushel corn will remove. Obviously, that may be on the high side, right? You can uh, we can do the same exercise with lower rates. Obviously, the numbers will do will look different, right? Um, okay. So one of the questions is uh, that's all good. You know, here we are seeing a positive return. Uh, so that's telling us, you know, you're on the lower side of salt SP, definitely pays to apply. Uh, I don't think there is any reason to think about cutting back on phosphorus in that situation. Um, what's happening here? Is this, uh, you know, obviously it's a negative year, but you know, if you are sitting somewhere around 30 parts per million, you're still putting phosphorus. Is this a loss? Right, I was trying to. Is that considered a loss of that phosphorus at that point or not? No, right? However, you're not seeing that benefit this year. Remember, this is a return to the year. Of hey, me again. Sorry, I, I uh, was, uh, trying to multitask this morning and not doing a very good job of it. So, uh, so, so yeah, just calling you back. Yeah. Um, uh, but, um, but anyway. There you go. <laughs> it's like, you got it. Yeah, you're good. Okay. So that makes sense. Questions, comments. Okay. So this is one. One thing about phosphorus, a little bit particular, that you know, in this situation, again, for those of you who's been doing build and maintain, um, we try to keep that so test P on the on the higher uh, range. Again, it's not really a loss. However, in a year like this, when phosphorus is pretty expensive, obviously you don't want to be building up so test phosphorus, right? You want to do that when fertilizer is cheaper, uh, and again, it's really a long term management. So that's why phosphorus is a little bit different, obviously, from, from nitrogen, because you are thinking multiple crops, multiple years. Uh, that's really how you manage that phosphorus. So again, going back to the initial point here, you know, if you are putting phosphorus here, it's not a loss because you are not, you're not losing that phosphorus. You're going to see it. Uh, but again, in this particular year, you're not getting your money back. Or, or you say that's 200 bushel corn, so that's about 200. Yes. This is this is the return uh, per acre, right? And and so the cost of application. Uh, and, and yes, one thing that I need to add here. Now, one thing that's going to be different, of course, when we have lower yields, obviously the application rates are going to be lower, also. So the the that the economics, the value here is going to be different for sure. Yes, but one thing that is very, very, it's going to be, it's not going to change very much is this point here, the break-even point, because this is still based on whether or not you are seeing a yield response. If you are seeing a yield response to any pound of phosphorus, then it becomes positive, right? And so I, I think this, again, this is not going to vary too much. Now, the the slope of this of this uh, curve is going to be. Different. And so here is the one thing, you know, if we look at case day recommendation, yes, yeah, 60, again, like I said, I wanted to emphasize the 60 pounds because that obviously could be different. Uh, you know, if we are in that lower soil test range of, 
you know, about five parts per million, recommendation is going to be about 70 pounds, right? If we are, you know, 10 to 15, it's going to be about 30 pounds. If we're closer to 20, it's going to be 15 pounds of each one, right? And so again, I want to emphasize that, you know, the, the, the numbers are going to be different. And so those of you who are in that range of 15 to 20, you know, 20 to 15 pounds of P2O5 is all you need to apply to get that yield response. More comments, questions? Okay. So the other thing also, uh, one of the questions is what about uh, kind of, this is the same, the same data set, but what I have here is yield response in, in bush spray, right? Uh, to every uh, to uh, uh, phosphorus application, same rate, 60 pounds of P2O5. How many bushes you are gaining? Um, <clears throat> and one of the things I wanted to emphasize here is what happened in this range uh, of 25, maybe part per million soil test P, where we kind of, uh, you know, always talking about do we, do we need to put starter fertilizers? What can we do in that situation? It's a little bit of a gray area, right? because we may actually get some yield response in that range. And our recommendation says that if you are in that range of uh, uh, 20 to 30, you can put starter fertilizers, okay? Just right, and obviously we're putting low rates in this case uh, to make sure capture any yield, yield benefit. Now, uh, if we see here, and again, trying to put this on, on economics, if we are somewhere around 25 parts per million, how many uh, bushels we can potentially get in average, maybe a couple bushel yield response. Right, that's really what we're talking about. How many gallons of 1034 you can buy with two bushes? Probably three, four, depends on the price today. But again, just think about it that in that sense, right? I mean, there is potential to get a little bit of yield benefit uh, in average in that in that range. Uh, and starter fertilizer may be the way to go in that situation. Now, one thing though, with the, with the starter fertilizers, and especially in these ranges, uh, it's not a sure thing. And we, we talk about this all the time. You know, starter fertilizers, you may or may not get a yield response. But we know we get early growth, you know, establishment, there are a lot of benefit from starter fertilizers, but that not always translate into yields. And that's where, you know, starter fertilizers become a little bit of a <coughs> question. Um, I talked to, um, have a, we have a meeting before the holiday and, and there was, the west uh western actually scott city and and one of the comments was uh, you know somebody say well i like starter fertilizers because you have you have early growth you know you have better coverage early you know it, where obviously wind and erosion could be a, a concern and so again there are many reasons why starter fertilizers can be of benefit for sure and again we can potentially capture maybe a couple of issues as well comments questions on this Thoughts on the starter fertilizer placement. It seems like as we get bigger planters, I'm noticing a lot of it getting dribbled on the line versus all the extra. That's a, that's a good point. What about placement? That make make a difference. And um, we don't put a better comparison. So uh, two by two versus dribble, and they are usually pretty. They are pretty comparable. Um, and so I would say those are good options. Um, obviously, pop up inferro with lower rates is very efficient. And so those are uh, uh, all good alternatives. Uh, the limitation with pop-up is, is the rates, right? We cannot put too much in for it. Uh, and so that's, that's the limitation there. Okay. Okay, so same exercise, basically this is with, uh, for a week, um, 40 pounds of P205, uh, and this is broadcast applied before uh, um, uh, really in the fall, okay? Uh, this is uh, data from 21 locations, um, a little bit more noisy for we, what we're seeing here, but this same thing, uh, salt test phosphorus and part per million, um, uh, mainly three. Uh, this is the price of weed and, and P205 that I use and this is the return to, to that application. Um, one thing that is uh, very clear in weed is that that critical value is higher than corn, okay? And so this telling us, and actually this is something we, we, we need to make a change based on um, these and more data that we're getting, we need to make a change to our recommendation at case state. Right now we're using 20 parts per million for all crops. Uh, consistently, we're seeing that wheat is more responsive. In other words, you need a little bit higher soil test P for wheat, okay? And so again, in this case, about 25 parts per million, uh, not quite, but close to 25 parts per million is that break-even point. 
Uh, and this is broadcast application. This I want to emphasize this because obviously for we, you know, if we're putting that phosphorus with a drill, with a seed, you can see much bigger response, much better response. And so that's another factor that we're gonna, gonna have a gonna play for we. Where you put that number for you, you mean when we are putting it with the drill? I I will tend to, to put that higher. Uh, and probably closer to about 30 parts per million when you're putting with the drill. And, and the, the challenge with that is that you also have other factors. You know, if you're planting late, you tend to see a better response to phosphorus as well. And obviously that, you know, you're putting maybe any tillers that you can gain in the fall from that starter is, is, is contributing to, to, to yield. The other thing, which is kind of interesting, what we saw in one location was that, you know, very high soil test P, but we still saw, saw a response uh, was in low pH, so about pH, but you know, we, we look at that data and say, what's going on here? And then you look at the pH, it was like four, nine or something like that. Uh, that's explained. Eh? And so with weed, I guess the, the point is that there's a lot more variables that may be affecting this response. And so I think that's something to keep in mind. Good question, good comments. Anything else? Okay, so um, all of this is pretty much on the assumption that you have good soil test information, right? I'm not gonna talk too much about this, uh, but you know, we, we basically are making all of these decisions based on soil test information. So we need to have good data, up-to-date soil test information to, to make this decision. Uh, a lot of things about, you know, good sampling methods, all of that. And I'll show you here a graph in a minute, but um, I, I want to emphasize when, I mean, all my data is, you know, case state recommendation primarily based on six inches using Melic tree. Okay, so just want to emphasize that because there are differences in depending on the test that they're using and uh, depending on, 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 on what something they and so on. Uh, what about things like variable rate? Again, that the graphs that I show you is assuming that the field is uniform, obviously, uh, for research, but we know that's not true, right? How many of you do uh, read something? Several hands, good, glad to see that. Uh, obviously you are familiar with kind of the kind of variability you see in your fields, right? Um, and, and again, there are opportunities there. That's one thing that I like to, to emphasize. I think uh, those of you doing grid sampling and doing variable rate, I think that's one place where we can definitely improve efficiency and put that fertilizer where it's needed. But we really, I mean, thinking about economics is you want to get the most response to that fertilizer. And obviously a, a uniform application may not be the way to go uh, to get that maximum, maximum return. So again, variable rate definitely is something to think about uh, for phosphorus. And, and I'll just touch a little bit on pH, but you know, typically the economics is pH is on top for, for return to investment to variable rate. If you, are, if you have to apply line, uh, to me, there's really no options. You have to do variable rate for many reasons. The economics, but also, uh, some of you who have variable rate, you see the variability pH that you can see in a field. It can be huge variability. So you also have the risk of maybe over applying in parts of the field, which actually will cause other problems. So line really needs to be variable rate and then phosphorus is another one that typically will, will pay um, for variable rate. Nitrogen uh, potentially, but to me that's really third in the, in the list. Uh, Okay, so this is the, the graph I wanted to show you and why um, soil test method really matters. And, and again, it's something that we need to pay a little bit of attention to that. Um, what I have here is Melic 3, which is again, kind of the, the standard that we tend to use and, and other methods available out there. Uh, this is Bray 1 uh, versus Melic 3. Again, very good correlation, except if you have high pH soils, okay? When you have high pH soils, that Bray 1 tends to underestimate uh, so this P. Okay, so it doesn't work very well on that high pH so. Uh, and again, Bray one was developed in Illinois. It's really worked pretty well in that, you know, in the corn belt. Uh, for us here, we start to see some high pHs. Uh, we start to see some problems. Um, and so again, just keep keep that in mind. Um, and, and when I say high pH, kind of the cutoff point uh, uh, based on our data uh, tends to be around 7.4. Anything that tends to be higher than 7.4, you start to see some problems with, with Bray. Uh, if you don't have anything like that, 7.4 or lower, uh, no need to worry about it. Okay. 
Uh, then also, which is the bicarbonate, uh, this is really uh, intended for high pH soils. So if you do dealing with some high pH soils, I'll definitely suggest using Olsen, mm -hmm. or again, you can still use the Melicree, which is pretty, pretty uh, flexible, basically depending on, on what we have. One other that we've been uh, evaluating for, for several years now is the Haney test, uh, the Haney H3A, and this specifically just for phosphorus. And uh, again, it works well, except again, same situation, high pH situations, we do have some problems. Okay. So um, I often get a question, is a Haney test a better test? And based on our data, I, I, I will not say it's a bad test, it's a good test, but I don't think it's necessarily better than things like Medicare, at least for, for phosphorus and, uh, and nitro, nitrogen. We haven't, we, we've been doing some evaluation, but nitrogen, I don't think is the, the case either, based on, on Kansas data. Comments, questions on this? Okay, um, so again, we talk a little bit about starter fertilizers and, and I think, um, and, and I wanna touch a little bit on other nutrients here, but one of the things I want to, um, just wanted to show these are multiple locations and low testing phosphorus. Uh, these all irrigated corn, uh, you know, without any starter with uh, MP and K combination, you have you know, in average, you can have some good yield responses. And again, a lot of that has to go back to what we just talking about earlier, that soil test uh, level where we are. Uh, micronutrients, this is a mix of micros and we basically put here uh, kind of the, the, the full mix of manganese, zinc, copper, boron, iron. Um, in this, uh, this location in particular, this average location, we didn't see any, any response to the micronutrients. Typically, the starter fertilizer is gonna be a response of, to nitrogen and phosphorus. And, and I, you know, we always talk about phosphorus, but in reality, uh, starter fertilizer, uh, you know, the, the, the application of nitrogen is also key, okay? Especially if we're doing in-season nitrogen application. We need to have a little bit of nitrogen early on for that early growth and, and getting that form forward, right? And so it's not just uh, the phosphorus, it's also the nitrogen. What about, uh, um, again, this is one location where we have actually a response to micronutrients. And, and again, in, in situations where you do have a potential for response, yes, we do have a benefit as well. Typically where we see the most response, the most responsive uh, micronutrients gonna be zinc. So keep an eye on that. You know, uh, From the micronutrients, uh, zinc is the one that I will definitely pay, pay attention to. Uh, other micros, you know, we, we've done a lot of evaluations and we've really never seen consistent response. Boron is one that's kind of maybe becoming a little bit more of a, something I like to watch. I don't know that I've seen a lot of consistent response, uh, but maybe we have some potential in, in sandy soils, low organic matter soils. Uh, boron in corn in particular is, is one thing that maybe is a possibility. Okay, but otherwise sink is the, from the micro sink is the one that I will pay attention to. Uh, especially for corn, uh, for Milo, this data for, uh, for <coughs> Milo, where we do see, this is a half pound of um, zinc, uh, chelated zinc applied two by two with the starter. Uh, and so this is another, another value of, of the starter fertilizer. You know, if we do know that we need to apply zinc or, or something else, maybe even sulfur, that's an opportunity to apply some of that, especially in a liquid system, right? And so this is for, for Milo. One thing I want to emphasize, so I'll test here for zinc, 0.6 part per million, okay? So critical value for zinc is one part per million. We don't need a lot, right? And so anything uh, above one part per million, no need to worry about it. Um, and I would say actually based on our data, we really need to get somewhere around 0.7 or lower to see more consistent yield response. But currently we use a critical value of one part per million. Comment or questions on this? Well, we're actually pretty smart. Uh, micro, where, where does sulfur fit in that? Where the what? Where does you got NP and K with the micros? Oh, sulfur. Um, yes, this is not sulfur, not including sulfur. Uh, I'll show here a data on sulfur, but that's another another key factor. And in reality, that's that's a very good point. You know, if I have to worry about secondary micronutrients after MP and K and pH line, 
sulfur will be the one in line. You know, and, 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 and this is very, I, I, I like you, you said, I'm glad you mentioned this because very often I see this situation where, you know, guys are asking about manganese and, you know, copper. And I ask a question, what is the pH? And, oh, I don't know. Right. and so, <laughs> you know, just, just thinking about, I mean, going through the list of priorities, I think is very important, especially a year like this. I mean, it sounds funny, but I mean, that's so often happens that, you know, we get bombarded by things in magazines, social media, that you need to put copper, you need to put this and that, but we are kind of forgetting about some of the basics. So in the list, the next of the list, for sure, I will look at sulfur before going in too much into some of the micros. Uh, those, the, the potential for yield response is bigger for sulfur. So if you are deficient in sulfur, you can see more bushes. Um, but if the, what I like about zinc in particular is that it's very easy to find out whether you need it or not. Soil techs work very well for zinc. So that's an easy one to think about. Good comments. Anything else? Any other comments, questions? Okay, so we'll switch a little bit now and uh, talk a little bit about nitrogen. I'm not gonna talk too much about nitrogen because uh, Luca is gonna focus more on that. Uh, we're actually, actually making some changes in our recommendations uh, and he's gonna explain that a little bit more and get into the, the economic side of that as well. But this is, uh, I just I wanted, wanted to introduce some key concepts when it comes to um, uh, especially economic optimum nitrogen rates. You know, when we think about nitrogen, we always think about agronomic maximum. You know, we try to get that max yield. However, you know, nitrogen is not free, especially not this year, right? And so again, we really need to be thinking about what is the economic optimum. <clears throat> and so I just want to introduce, and again, it's, it's a term that you hear before, but I don't know that we often think about it much, okay? Um, and so this is data, actually, this response curve is data from close to about 120 trials that we did in, across Kansas in the last uh, 15 to 20 years, okay? Uh, so we combine this, um, this is the regression line, and we have a couple of points that I want to point out here. The maximum yields basically your, you know, agronomic maximum where you basically, you know, assuming that nitrogen is not, is free, essentially, right? Um, and then the next point here that I'm showing is uh, the economic optimum, which usually tends to be lower than the maximum, okay? Because there's always going to be a cost to nitrogen fertilizer. So we're never going for the maximum yield. We're always going slightly lower. How much lower depends on how expensive is the nitrogen. The expensier the nitrogen, this point is gonna move a little bit further down. And if nitrogen is cheap, it's gonna be closer to that maximum. That's kind of how the way that number works, okay? Um, and again, that's just wanted to put that in that concept and, and, and think about that a little bit more. So I do get this question often. Um, should I cut back my rates on, on, on nitrogen? And when nitrogen is expensive, yes, if you are thinking about, if you really want to put economic optimum, you should be cutting back some. The problem is when some guys want to cut back half the rate, right? That's, then we have an issue. But typically, again, if we are really going after that economic optimum, we should be cutting back a little bit. Comments, questions on that? That makes sense? Okay, so, Based on that data, what I did basically is, uh, I tried to look at this economic optimum based on the price of corn and nitrogen. Basically the ratio of one bushel of corn to one pound of nitrogen. And so what we have here now is the net return to nitrogen fertilizer, okay? Uh, and this is the, 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 the rates, pounds, pounds per acre, okay? And this is using uh, ratios of, uh, again, different ratios of corn to nitrogen prices, okay? So when you're looking at something like 12, that means you can essentially buy 12 pounds of nitrogen with one bushel of corn, okay? Basically the nitrogen is cheap, right? In this case, nitrogen, very expensive compared to, compared to corn. And so what do you see there? A few things that's very clear, you know, if nitrogen is expensive, you know, the, the economic optimum nitrogen tends to be lower, right? That's one thing that's very clear. Obviously, overall, your return is, is lower, but also your economic optimum tends to be 
slightly, slightly lower. Where are we today in terms of ratio? Five, we're around there. I asked a question the other day, so if I say three, maybe. <laughs> I don't know if it's quite that, that much, but it is expensive right now, right? And so that means we really um, should be thinking about cutting back a little bit, you know, based on your historic, let's assume that your historic value is somewhere around seven. And if you're thinking about, I don't know, think of, keep in mind kind of your price of corn and price of nitrogen, and, and you can come up with that. I would say somewhere around six, seven, maybe it's kind of more of a historical rate uh, ratio. Um, compared to what's today, which is five, you know, if you look at the economic optimum, it's slightly lower, not much lower. Though. How many pounds we are talking about here? 15, 20, maybe something like that. So yes, if you are going after that economic optimum nitrogen based on your historic number that you've been using over the years, yes, it will make sense to cut back a little bit. And again, I'm talking 15, definitely no more than 20 pounds of nitrogen. And I want to emphasize that because what happens if you cut too much? Look at this, this slope here. Your return definitely is gonna go down and, and actually see you causing more problems than. You just have to be careful not to cut too much. So again, a few things here, uh, you know, the economic optimal nitrogen um, uh, basically decrease with, you know, when you have a uh, high with decreasing corn to nitrogen uh, ratio again with expensive nitrogen uh, one of the things also that is very clear here is that you know if nitrogen is cheap you know the the, the penalty for over application is not very big okay so you can put a little bit more and you are not really losing much money there in that cheap scenario what happens if nitrogen is expensive if you're putting too much you suddenly have a penalty there Makes sense, right? If, if nitrogen is expensive, you don't want to put too much. If you're wasting nitrogen, obviously you're going to be losing money. So just kind of keep the, keep in mind those kind of scenarios. In a year like this, it becomes more important um, to make sure you're not putting too much. Is also another another key factor. Obviously, you don't want to put too little, but too much is to be a problem as well. Comments, questions. Right? Makes sense. Tell me what the weather is going to be. Yeah, that I, that I don't know. And I should say also, I don't know what the price of fertilizer is going to do. I, the meeting last, last fall, uh, first thing I say is, I, don't ask me what's going to be the price of fertilizer. And that was one of the questions I got still. Uh, I don't think anybody knows, but there have been some decrease, I think, so, which is good. So, okay. Uh, I'll switch a little bit now and, and, and think one of the other questions is what about tools that we have out there to maybe improve efficiency, like additives? Can we get some benefit from additives? And I think it's a fair question and I think we need to evaluate those. And there are opportunities. One of the things, this is um, data from a couple of years looking at urease inhibitors. Uh, and in this case, we're looking at a couple of brands, uh, which is basically MBPT, Agrotain, which has been around for, for years. Amble is another uh, a newer one also. Uh, it's a little bit more uh, different, but also based on the MBPT uh, technology, essentially. Um, and can we get a benefit yield-wise from these products? Yes, no question about it. Uh, again, you can see the lines here. You see higher yields with the Agrotain and, and the Amble compared to the urea alone. Now, this is citrus urea, uh, you know, V6 or so in June. And we are doing this study on purpose, trying to, to favor volatilization losses, okay? So we're looking at the forecast, make sure we're not gonna have any rainfall to incorporate. In other words, when you have a situation for volatilization, you see a benefit. But you know, some of you that may be injecting the nitrogen or you know, incorporating the nitrogen or maybe have irrigation where you can you know, put it with the irrigation, obviously volatilization is not a problem. And so in this case, the, 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 my point is that um, it's really a little bit of a kind of an insurance, right? The other thing too, and we've we done this oftentimes is that, you know, you, we do the study and then we got a rain two or three days later. We don't see any difference, obviously, because we are incorporating that nitrogen in the soil, right? And so just think about those things and, and kind of how that may be working in your system. 
yes, volatilization is a challenge, it's, 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 it's real, but you know, there's some moving parts there in kind of what kind of situation you may see the, the most benefit. Okay. Your question is what about inhibitors? Uh, and this is um, uh, spring and hydros, which again, I have to, we have to uh, say is, is already a fairly efficient system. And this is um, four years of data, eight, look, uh, eight side years essentially. And um, out of those eight side years, we basically saw a yield advantage three years, okay? And so are these products doing what supposed to do? Mm -hmm. Yes. But again, the question is again, what kind of system you have and what is the risk of losing nitrogen? And I think that's, we just have to evaluate each PO uh, uh, basically based on conditions that we have there. What kind of source we are using, timing of your nitrogen, um, you know, sandy soils versus fine texture soils, all of that's gonna play a factor, okay? And so I think that's, that's a key, uh, key message here. Uh, and this is uh, using and serve, there are many other um, inhibitors out there. Uh, some of them are pretty good. Some of the new ones are coming. There are also some that don't have the research to back up, you know, how, how well they're doing. And so I think that's made things a little bit more complicated. So we just have to do a little bit of research, talk to, you know, the agronomies, uh, look at research and see what, what's working. Comments, questions? Back to your volatility. I get asked about it every year, it seems like, how warm does the day before things really start taking off in the atmosphere? Mm -hmm. It always seems like it's about time we were getting ready to put down fertility for sorghum, right? It's always planted later, a little warmer. Yeah, and, and that, that's a good point. What is gonna drive volatilization is really um, uh, soil moisture that when you have the evaporation is driving that and also temperature. And really the higher the temperature, I would say above 70, 75, we start to see more pickup of, of potential volatilization. And the higher the temperature combined with wind uh, is, is kind of driving that faster. However, we can see volatilization even for top dressing wheat in the winter. Obviously it's just very small amount, right? But over time that can also add up. And so we, we do have some data on top dressing wheat, especially not till that where we are actually able to measure some volatilization. And so again, that's, that's, that's possible. Um, but typically again, sorghum is, I agree with you, sorghum is one that typically we tend to see the, the, the biggest issue because of the time. There's another question there. So the spring of fire, these days? Yes, this is a hydros in March. And so mm -hmm. that's a very good point. I want to emphasize that because mm -hmm. this is already a pretty efficient system. Right, and hydros in March is pretty efficient compared to and hydros in the fall, and uh, obviously other fertilizer sources. Well, how would you anticipate that chart or that study to look on the fall? I think it will look. You will see a lot more uh, potential benefits here, especially last year. A lot of guys put in hydros a little bit earlier. You know when. Because on the uncertainty and everything, I saw a lot of anhydrous application that went a little bit earlier. In that situation, my recommendation is, yeah, make sure and put some, some inhibitors. <coughs> because again, what's gonna be driving that potential loss here is all microbial process, right? It's, I mean, you are converting that ammonia into uh, ultimately nitrate, which is really what's gonna be leaching. And all of that is micro. So for microbial activity, you need temperature and moisture, right? So warmer temperature is gonna go faster. And so, yes, fall is going to look, for sure, it's going to look better. This fall, winter has been pretty mild. Do you think it's been warm enough that we see some issues with that? Um, that's, a, that's, that's a very good point. And I've been, um, I've been, from time to time, I look at the, you know, the mesonet, the soil temperature. And, and what we really need to be focusing is the soil temperature. You will be amazed that soil temperature is not, it doesn't change as much as the earth temperature. And so I think that's, that's one thing that we have to keep in mind. Having said that, yes, there have been some days where I'm seeing temperature in the soil going, you know, close to 50. And, and that's where you're starting to see more activity. And so you're right. That, and that's a challenge with fall application. You don't know how the fall and winter is going to be for us. And we can have some warm days in Kansas in the fall and winter. And whenever you have some uh, warm temperatures, there's going to be microbial activity there. No question about it. 
you're getting above 50 degrees, that microbial activity is gonna, it's gonna start to, to happen. And so in that situation, again, the inhibitors can, can help us a little bit more. That's a very good, very good comment. Good question. I suppose you talk at soil temperature, then your depth of application probably comes in to be a factor. That's another key factor. And I usually I usually look at the <clears throat> four inch temperature, which is I, I think is a better reference. And if you look at the two inch, uh, first of all, there's a lot more variability in that two inches, but obviously in hydro it's gonna be at least four inches. So that four inch depth is more stable than you might think. Mm -hmm. Temperature, temperature weighs a lot more stable than you may think, because again, uh, these small fluctuations that we're seeing, you know, a couple of days at warm up. That four inches tends to, yeah, it's going to increase, but usually not, not too much. Any other comments, questions? Where were you referenced the cup versus the beach? No, no, I don't have. But we are starting to get to that time pretty soon. Does it make sense? Something to the top first? The, the one situation where I, where I see uh, measurable uh, volatilization losses is when you have very heavy residue and that you assuming you're doing urea. That's the one thing. Dry urea is gonna always have a bigger issue uh, because obviously it's 100% urea. And if you have heavy residue and some of that urea sitting on top of residue, it's not dissolving the soil. So you're not have that interaction. That urea sitting there basically you know, a little bit of dissolved, but still sitting on, on, on crop residue, that's what's subject to volatilization. That's the situation where we see the measurable amount of volatilization. UAN? UAN, I don't expect to see the, the, the same issue, uh, especially if you're using, you know, streamer bars or anything like that, uh, because again, the same thing, that UAN is gonna go in contact with the soil. When it's in contact with the soil, you're not gonna see a, 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 a big issue there. The other thing also, UAN is only 50% urea. We have to keep that in mind. And volatilization is only really an issue with urea, right? And so right there, by using UAN, you're cutting your potential volatilization in half, essentially. And then using things like streamer bars, my opinion, you're taking care of that issue. The other thing too, is that, you know, uh, you asked about sulfur. Some guys putting more, you know, thiosulfate, things like that. You know, we know that thiosulfate has some activity as a um, uh, inhibitor of volatilization uh, 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 activity. Not as much as MBPT, but there's a little bit of activity there as well. Yeah. And a lot of that has to do with pH. Uh, I mean, we have high pH, you have more volatilization losses, and thiosulfate tends to acidify things a little bit. And that basically slow down the, the volatilization process, the um, hydrolysis of urea, where would you really have the, the volatilization? I'm not showing anything here, uh, but we've done some comparison of, of thiosulfate and MBPT. And like I say, it's not quite the same as MBPT. MBPT is still getting the, the most uh, activity as inhibitor, but thiosulfate do have. Yeah, and then and I don't have any of that data. The, the, usually, what we do is I what I do. I usually still just try to to apply enough sulfur to keep the the you know to meet the crop demands. And so typically, that's going to be trying to target somewhere around no more than fifteen pounds of sulfur. Okay, and so that basically, and so I don't know that I pay too much attention to the ratio, but I, for sure I want to meet the sulfur demands. Good question. Okay. Okay, so the other uh, thing I wanted to touch a little bit on, and I'm sure you hear about things like pivot bio quite a bit. Um, there's a lot of development in, in, in products like that. And um, basically what this type of product is trying to do is uh, use uh, uh, microbes essentially that can fix nitrogen, right? And so basically live uh, organisms that, you know, we're putting in furrow close to the roots. And the idea is that this, uh, Bacteria is going to fix some atmospheric nitrogen and pass it to the corn uh, and get some potential nitrogen uh, benefit there. And, and there are a lot of development there. Um, I, I have to be completely honest, I've always been very skeptical about these products uh, because 
Uh, we have a long history of, you know, things that didn't work, but there are a lot of good research, research going on right now in, in this area. And I think there is potential. This is one, one site, one year, so take it for what it's worth, I guess, but uh, this is in Manhattan looking at uh, pivot bio. Uh, and the two graphs here is plant nitrogen uptake at the, uh, R6, a black layer, uh, and this is brain yield. Uh, nitrogen rates with and without pivot bio in front. And so one thing that to me uh, made me think that, you know, something's happening is the first graph here is that we do tend to see a little bit of higher <clears throat> nitrogen uptake with the pivot pipe. However, that is not translating into yields, at least in horse study. Okay. And so um, I think the data, and, and last year we have another, another uh, study and, and essentially similar results. Uh, I think there are many things going on here. Well, one of them for sure, in my opinion, is that, you know, we are making some progress. There's some activity, but clearly seems that it's not enough to really make a difference yield-wise yet, at least consistently in some of these studies. The other thing, and I talked to the pivot bio guys, uh, uh, agronomists, they have some really good agronomists uh, working for them. And uh, one of the things we talk a lot about is what about the environment? They do have a lot of good data from Iowa, from Illinois, you know, uh, better, better environments. We come into Kansas, you know, summer, hot, dry, and remember there are still basically, um, you know, live organs, right? If we don't have, you know, if, if you have those conditions, these are not growing actively, what's the effect there? And so I think those are some questions. And, and there are some discussion, obviously some more research going on. So hopefully in the future, we'll see um, better results. No, we haven't done anything on irrigated. And that's one question I got already um, a few weeks ago. And, and that, that's a good question because if you have you know, better moisture, uh, maybe, maybe better soil temperature, would that make a difference? And, and maybe, and I don't have the data to say that. But that's a, that's a fair question. Because again, the data that I'm seeing from, from them is, is a lot of it's from Iowa and obviously just better environment. Any other comments, questions? So, um, uh, so again, like I say, I used to be pretty skeptical, but I, I'm, I'm excited. I think there are some good things happening. They're putting a lot of uh, investment on research and they're doing good research. So I think hopefully in the future, we'll see more uh, 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 better things coming. Now, what really worries me is that there's still some products out there. I, I have a question a few weeks ago um, from a product that is claiming that can fix 80% of the nitrogen. That's a lot. And I don't know if that's right. I mean, obviously that's, we have an issue there. When you have somebody claiming that you can fix 80% of the nitrogen, I mean, that's not realistic. So my point is that we have to be realistic also what to expect here, okay? Don't expect that you're gonna put these products and you don't have to put any nitrogen because that's not real. I mean, it's, I mean if, if you have somebody fixing 80% of the nitrogen, I mean, that's Nobel Prize. I don't know why you have to hear about that, okay? So there are many products out there also that, you know, use claiming things that, you know, without the research is a big issue. And, and again, we're always gonna have that. So just pay attention to that, try to see what, what's out there in research and, and, and make sure that not, it's a lot of advertisement out there, especially with the high fertilizer prices. Okay. Okay, so the other thing I want to touch on nitrogen here is um, what about management of nitrogen in terms of, of timing, sources, placement? Do we have any opportunities there to uh, improve efficiency and ultimately, uh, obviously, the return to investment? And this is one example, one location, and we have nine sites this year, uh, last year, 21. I'm going to put more, more sites this year. Uh, but what we're trying to do here is to look at the efficiency of different nitrogen management systems. So basically, again, looking at things like placement, timing, sources. Uh, and so what you have here is basically nitrogen fertilizer uh, rates, uh, this yield, uh, irrigated corn. Um, and the line here is basically, uh, you know, your typical response to nitrogen fertilizer. And this is using urea broadcast at plant. Okay, so multiple rates, develop that response curve. Um, 
But then the, the dots that you're seeing here, the, the red dot is basically, um, is a different application uh, and source UAM folder injected at planting. So first of all, what you're seeing is that, you know, it's very clear, this system is showing a higher yield compared to the baseline system that we have in that location, okay? Um, so what that means, you know, at the same rate of nitrogen, we're basically getting higher yields, right? simply a higher efficiency in these things. And so this is something that I, I mention a lot when you know, guys thinking about cutting back rates significantly. We, obviously we talked about the economic optimum before, but if you're trying, you're thinking about cutting back a lot, to me, I would pay more attention to this. How are we putting the nitrogen? Can we do a better job putting that nitrogen? And there are many opportunities there, I think, to, to improve efficiency. Uh, and ultimately it's obviously a return to investment. I think that, that's, that's really where we have a lot, a lot more opportunities. So some of you already been doing a good job. So again, you're kind of taking care of that. But again, one, I'm just thinking one of the questions I got this guy that really wanted to cut back rates. And I asked, how are you putting the nitrogen? And he said, broadcast you know, in spring on Nokia. That's not very efficient. And we do better. And so in this particular study, we're looking at multiple um, options. Um, and just to give you an idea, you know, uh, there are some systems like streaming UAN at planting, equal basically to broadcast urea. Uh, again, we do have better uh, uh, efficiency with anything injected, alter UAN, two by two UAN, which again, we can put 100% of the nitrogen by two by two, it, uh, yeah, two by two if you, if you want to. Usually not very practical. Many people don't like it. They want to, you, you need to cover multiple acres. But again, I know some people that do it, they're very happy with it. Um, and other things maybe actually not very is less efficient. Okay? And again, that's that's where we're trying to see what what kind of system is, is more is better, right? And a lot of these will vary, of course, depending on whether we are doing no till or we're doing conventional tillage. In no till system placement make a big difference, usually, okay? Because we do have the issue of potential tie ups uh, that we have with no till and, and rest. Of it. Comments, questions on this. Okay, so the other thing also that, um, again, kind of going back to what's the limiting factor um, in this uh, data that I like always to show because I think it's a, it's a, it's a classical example of, uh, you know, this is a long-term study from Tribune, but only nitrogen, uh, nitrogen plus uh, phosphorus, uh, 40 pounds of P2O5 in this case. Low, low test CP, long-term. Uh, again, with the same rate of nitrogen, obviously you're improving uh, yield significantly. So again, that efficiency on the use of nitrogen increased quite a bit. But the key here is, uh, again, we have to identify what is the limiting factor. In this case, phosphorus is really the, the limiting factor. So putting more nitrogen is not gonna solve the problem. So that's my point. And the same goes for other nutrients. We talk, just touched about sulfur, pH, and so on. This is one, um, this data from a couple of years also, and we, we keep doing this is 18 locations of soybeans um, uh, and uh, response to phosphorus fertilizer versus salt test. And again, many three, uh, six inches salt test B, uh, relative yield response in soybeans. Um, critical value based on this data, which again is preliminary data, so we're still adding lab sites to this, somewhere around 17 parts per million salt test B. I mentioned earlier, we really need to have maybe higher salt test B. Corn probably needs to be somewhere around that 20. Soybean is actually lower, okay? And so that's, that's just the nature of the crop. Soybean always tends to be uh, basically more efficient in the use of phosphorus for many reasons. Uh, and again, that critical value is a little bit lower. But that's not really the main reason I wanted to show this. The main reason I wanted to show this is these two dots here. Look at the pH. I don't know if you can read it. This one is 4.8. This one is 5.1. So when I, I look at this data, and first of all, I didn't, I, I say, what's going on with these two sites? What was there? You know, it's, you're seeing about 50 to 75 part per million salt test P, and yet you're not, you're what, 80, 85% uh, of you. And so we went and looked at what's going on. And first thing is, am I student? You mess up something here. And we went and looked at the pH and you see this problem. 
And so again, going back here, and, and somebody told me once, sometimes in that kind of situation, it's cheaper to buy lime than to apply fertilizer phosphorus, right? I, I like that very much, which again, this is a classical <clears throat> situation where again, in this case, you don't need to put more phosphorus. You have plenty of P, but again, what you really need to take care of is your pH. Again, just thinking about what's that limiting factor, I think we, we need to keep that in mind. And essentially what happened here, which is not uncommon, you know, in the past, we essentially lined with phosphorus. And that's not uncommon for wheat. You know, we've been doing that over, over, over the, the years, you know. You have low pH, you put some in for phosphorus. Essentially, you're liming with phosphorus there. That's not, this is not the year to do that. I don't think. And so again, pH, again, just want to touch on that a little bit. Uh, I think we do see some pH issues uh, in this part of the state and, and something to pay attention to, especially if you're starting to, uh, if you're growing things like soybeans, a lot more sensitive. Questions, comments on this? Okay, um, where we want to be on, in terms of pH, uh, at least we want to be somewhere around that pH uh, target of six, six to six, four. Um, a minimum is where we would like to be. We are, uh, we, if we see pH below 5.8, and especially if we're seeing pH of 5, 5 and lower, then we have a problem. And that's typically, again, we know all of that basics. Low pH is affecting availability of the nutrient. Uh, and obviously if it gets pretty low, then we have aluminum toxicity. We have some uh, bigger issues in that case. Again, just, just keep that in mind. And we already talked about this before. Sulfur. Um, just a few things I wanted to touch here. We, we've been doing quite a bit of work on, on wheat and, and corn. Um, sulfur is uh, in many ways a little bit like nitrogen. You know, it really comes from organic matter. So we need to have mineralization. It's also mobile. So we really need, ideally we need to look at profile tests for sulfur. If we're suspecting some sulfur issues, I would definitely encourage you to get a profile test at least once to see what you have there in that profile. Because you can have accumulation of sulfur also in the below the profile. So sometimes with that six or eight inches, whatever you're collecting surface, you may not really see anything of salt. And this is one example. Um, this is two locations, 40% um, sun, 1.5% organic matter versus 14% sun, uh, close to 3% organic matter. And this is uh, just different sources, uh, um, zero nitrogen, um, 180 pounds of nitrogen, I believe this was, uh, using urea and UAN, and this is adding a 15 pounds of, of sulfur, okay? And so you see a response here in this sandy soil, no response in the uh, fine texture soil. We did um, also an exercise, uh, an study last year looking at about 25 uh, uh, sites and soils across the state, kind of, kind of capturing the, the variety of soils. And what we found is that you know, when you see sun content about 20% sun and profile sulfur below two parts per million, that's usually where you tend to see a consistent response to sulfur. Okay, so those are the things that I will watch for. If you, you know you have a sun content more than 20% um, and then your, your, your profile is coming lower than two parts per million, very likely you're gonna see a, a good yield response in that situation. You notice I don't have organic matter here. Why you think that is in our analysis that didn't come up as a problem? Because typically, where, whatever you have high sun content, that's also going to be low organic matter, right? And so those kind of go together, right? If you have a sandy soil. I mean, those of you who have sandy soils, uh, you know when talking about, I mean, it's really very difficult to push organic matter very high, right? And so those kind of go hand in hand. So um, that's, that's really kind of a, in my opinion, this is basically kind of already telling you something about the organic matter content in that soil. Comments, questions? I don't know where you're at. Yes, Lucas is here? Yep. Okay. So with that, we'll finish here. Uh, that's basically all I have. The, the last thing I wanted to just mention is um, that, you know, um, manure is a good option. And, and this year we're seeing that obviously transportation of manure can definitely pay, depending if you have access to sources, it's a good option. Uh, and again, the challenge is usually transportation, but in a year like this can definitely pay. Any other questions, comments as we are switching here? I know you're out of time. But... 
No, we didn't talk much about potassium. And, and so we are, we actually have a study on soybeans. Um, you can buy it on, on soybeans and potassium. And, um, you know, we, one of the challenges with potassium that we're seeing is that the soil test we have obviously is not as good. 